the last chapter in the book. And um, as you can see, there are uh, a whopping three verses. So um, we'll see. <laughs> Why don't we pray first, if you would, <laughs> join with me. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word and for our time together in your word tonight, Lord. We're really looking forward to what you have for us. Lord, it is with almost a, um, a bitter sweetness that we're going to finish this book tonight. It's um, almost with really a sadness to uh, uh, be done with this book. It's been such a blessing, and you've really uh, ministered so much to us in and through this book as we've just seen your hand, your mighty hand uh, at work providentially in everything. So Lord, bless our time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Thank you for your patience with me. I'm still trying to uh, get rid of this cough slash asthma. So uh, let's jump in, verse uh, one. So we're told, and the king, King Ahasuerus, imposed a tribute on the land and on the islands of the sea. Now, verse 2, all the acts of his power and his might and the account of the greatness of Mordechai to which the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Medea and Persia? For, verse 3, Mordechai, the Jew, was second to King Ahasuerus and pardon me, I'm so sorry, and was great among the Jews and well received by the multitude of his brethren, seeking the good of his people and speaking peace to all his countrymen. So that's the end of the chapter. Let's close in prayer. We'll go eat. Uh, not so fast. Uh, we're told that it was due to Mordecai's greatness that the king promoted him to second in the kingdom. This is like Joseph before him because of his greatness as well. Both Mordecai and Joseph had favor in God's eyes and God made them great so much so that they became the most powerful men in the world next to, in Joseph's case, Pharaoh, and in Mordecai's case, uh, he was the most powerful man in the world next to the king. We're also told that he was received well. Can you imagine how word must have spread throughout the kingdom of all that God had done to not just the Jews, but to the Persians as well? Uh, there's something to be said about a man or a woman of God whom God has blessed so powerfully and so in such an amazing way. And it never escapes the notice of people's attention. And there's a much earned respect, for lack of a better way of saying that. So there's no wonder that he was so well received by the multitude. And we're told very, uh, two very interesting details in verse 3. The first of which is that he sought the good of his people. Now contrast that with his predecessor, uh, Haman, who did not seek the good of the Jewish people, but in fact sought the polar opposite and sought to kill them and annihilate them. But we're told secondly, that he also spoke peace to all the Jews. This is now a time of peace for the Jews there in the kingdom and all of its provinces. I have to say that, and I think you would agree with me when I say this, that the book of Esther is one of the most fascinating, if not the most fascinating books in all of the Bible. And I say that for a number of reasons, chief of which is, and we talked about this at the beginning of the study, uh, God's providential sovereignty. And by that, I mean his arranging providentially 
in his sovereignty behind the scenes all of the events that took place in this amazing account and we see it throughout the book from front to finish and I want to tonight uh, revisit all that God did and I do so <clears throat> pardon me because I think it's going to be germane to our understanding of the application uh, to our lives per personally. This book is rich in the way of personal application to our lives, especially for those of us who are going through uh, trials and difficulty in our lives. And um, I think it's a uh, much needed encouragement to remember that God is at work even when we don't see Him. And even when it seems that everything is against us and all of the circumstances are so adverse and yet it, it almost seems like God is silent when in fact He is not only not silent, I know that's not proper sentence structure, <laughs> you'll forgive me, but not only is God not silent, but God is working in magnificent ways uh, behind the scenes. So I want to talk about that. But I want first to uh, kind of go over some of the things that God did uh, providentially in arranging everything and sort of orchestrating everything. And uh, I actually spent a considerable amount of time uh, going through this book. It was a joy, believe me, to kind of it's kind of like watching a movie for the second or third time. And, and you pick up more things when you go through it, or when you see a, a, a movie uh, for a second time. So I actually found 195 things that I want to share with you. No, not 195. I said 195 because uh, there's actually only 38. And 38 doesn't sound like a lot when you say first 195. So is that, that's still kind of a lot, but... Uh, it's on 195. So I have 38 things that I'd like to take the next three hours and uh, share with you and kind of go over. It won't take that long, but let's start at the beginning. Number one, God orchestrated the king's banquets in such a way, God did this, that Vashti would be deposed as queen for refusing his invitation. Number two, God then arranged for a pageant of sorts, I, that's for lack of a better word, in order to choose a new queen from amongst the most beautiful <clears throat> young women <clears throat> that were in the kingdom. Uh, number three, God set it up in his providence perfectly for Esther, a Jew, to be one of those who would be taken to the palace in order to be one of the contestants, as it were. Number four, God gave special favor to Esther in the eyes of the eunuchs by making her stand out above uh, all the other women, so much so that they actually gave her uh, additional privileges in her own private uh, quarters, uh, more so than any of the other women that were uh, there. Number five, God positioned, this is all happening sort of simultaneously in concert with everything that's happening with Esther. God positions Mordecai within the gates of the kingdom so that he can have access to both Esther as well as the affairs of the kingdom. This is going to uh, be very key as we saw and will again tonight uh, see. Number seven, God had Esther in the perfect position and at the perfect time to preempt the assassination by informing the king in time. But see, God also had Mordecai in that perfect place at that perfect time to hear of the plot and then to let Esther know. Had he not been where he was at the time he was, which God arranged it, God had set it up perfectly that he was right there at the right time within earshot of this plot to assassinate the king. Number eight, God delayed 
the rewarding of Mordecai for saving the king's life because it would come at a later time and for good reason. This was huge. When I was going back over this, I thought, um, I wonder what Mordecai thought. Wow, that's the thanks I get. I just saved the king's life. And, and what about the king? And by the way, they, they don't take this lightly. When someone saves the king's life, I mean, think about that. They're going to reward him just, I mean, magnificently, and yet nothing happens. Yet we also read nowhere in the narrative where Mordecai is complaining like, hey, hello, I saved your life, man. <laughs> Where's my reward? Uh, and that was God. It's been said, kind of getting ahead of myself here a little bit, but uh, God directs not only our steps, but our stops. Let me say the same thing in a different way. God will direct our steps, but so too will God direct our stops. And we see throughout the book of Esther where God, in fact, is going to stop Esther that, at that first banquet from revealing uh, what her request is. She has available to her, per the king, up to half of his kingdom. And God, I'm again getting ahead of myself. Let's uh, move on here. So uh, God did that. God delayed the rewarding of Mordecai because uh, it's going to come at a later time and not just a later time, but at the perfect time. Number nine, we, <laughs> bear with me. We have 38. We'll, we'll, try, we'll get through these. Number nine, God had Haman promoted at the exact time, but Mordecai, who was in the king's gate, refused to bow down and worship him. Number 10, God set up Haman, who is now enraged, so that he would convince the king, and he did, to issue this irrevocable edict to annihilate all of the Jews. God allowed that. Make no mistake about it. This is all going perfectly according to God's perfect plan. And it is serving his purpose in the end. I know we've talked about this, but perhaps this is a, as good of a time as any to mention it again. The devil is God's devil. He is a created being. Uh, he is not God's opposite, nor is he God's equal. He is a created being and as such, the devil can do nothing unless God allows him to. Ask Job about that. By the way, that's our next book, <laughs> is the book of Job. And right out of the chute, we're going to read this very disturbing uh, account of how Satan has access to heaven. Think about that. Still, by the way. That's why there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. So Satan has still access to heaven, to the throne. And he goes to God and he is now challenging and God knows exactly what he's doing. I, we're we're going to get into the book of Job tonight, I guess. So, <laughs> but God knows exactly what he's doing. And he kind of eggs, this actually happened. He actually eggs Satan on. Hey, uh, Satan, have you... Uh, have you seen my servant Job? Is there anyone righteous like him? Ah, funny you should bring that up. God, this is a very loose paraphrase, obviously, but funny you should bring that up. That's actually why I'm here today. That's uh, the occasion in which I find myself before the throne. Um, I want to uh, suggest to you that if you were, of course he's righteous. Look how much you've blessed him. Now, I, 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 let's make a bet. <laughs> let's make a bet. Um, I'll bet you if you uh, uh, did something to him, he'll curse you. <laughs> I can almost hear God say, actually he won't. His wife will, <laughs> but he won't. But that's another topic for another time. Um, so uh, God says, okay, uh, you're on. You're on. 
So Satan, so he gives Satan permission. Reminds me of when Jesus says to Peter, um, Peter, Satan has asked for permission for you to sift you as wheat. Uh, but uh, I have, and I can just imagine Peter going, you didn't give him permission, did you? <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, I did. But I only did because in the end, it's going to serve my purpose. You'll see. When, you're, when you get through it, you're going to make it. Because I will not let him touch even a hair on your head unless it ultimately serves my purpose in the end. So he allows Peter to, uh, Satan to sift Peter as wheat, and it ultimately fulfills God's purpose. Well, so too does God allow Satan permission to start, uh, you know, bringing all of this affliction, all of these horrific things uh, into Job's life. I mean, he loses everything. And within a, it, it, it seems within a short period of time, everything that happens to him is close in proximity. Uh, one with the other. And we're going to go through, it's a relatively uh, long book, and we're going to go through all of the things. And, he, and then his friends show up, if you can uh, call them that, with friends like that, who needs enemies, right? And, and it's really interesting because I, I had no intention of going into Job, but it actually uh, kind of ties in with what I wanted to talk about here. Because see, God allowed Haman to do this. Why? Because ultimately it served God's purpose in the end. And that's why he allowed Satan to do what he did. So what's the, what's the takeaway? God will never allow the enemy to do anything to us unless it ultimately serves his purpose in the end. The devil is God's devil. So when adversity strikes, and adversity strikes, when those trials hit, when those problems arise and they just seem so overwhelming and you, you, you say, God, why are you allowing this to happen? And you'll forgive the oversimplification with which I uh, try to answer that question. Uh, when we ask God, why are you allowing this? Here's God's answer. Just wait. You'll see. Those four words. Just wait, you'll see. You'll see what I'm doing. You, you can't see it now. Think about this. At the time that this is happening, Mordechai and certainly Esther don't have the benefit of knowing how it's going to end. We do because we have the end of the story. <laughs> we have chapter 10. We have chapter 9. We have chapter 8. So, but when they're going through it, they have no idea how God is going to work this out. Now, by faith, and we know this, especially with Mordechai, he knows God's going to do it. He just doesn't know how. He doesn't know the way. He doesn't know when. And it's evidence when he tells Esther, how do you know that you haven't been positioned for such a time as this? Okay? And if you don't do this, deliverance will come from another. In other words, oh, God's going to deliver us. I don't know who he's going to use. He's positioned you, but if you refuse, then he'll choose and use somebody else. But he will deliver us. God will have the final word, whatever that situation is in yours and my life. You have a Haman in your life. God's going to have the final. <laughs> You're laughing because some of you already, someone came to mind when I said Haman. That's, that's my boss. No, it's not your boss. Your boss is not Haman. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against people. This is a spiritual battle. And it's fought in the spiritual realm. Paul says our weaponry is not carnal in nature. We don't fight a spiritual battle with carnal weapons. Ask Peter about that when on that night they came to arrest Jesus. And what does Peter do? He takes out his physical weapon and he takes his sword and he cuts off Malchus's ear. And it's as if Jesus says to him, Peter, uh, you have no idea what's going on here. This is not a physical battle that is fought with sword 
This is a spiritual battle. What is taking place here is fought in the realm of the spirit. And by the way, when we get to uh, Ephesians chapter six, can't wait. And the men and women's uh, study are going to be uh, talking about the, the spiritual armor. This is the spiritual weaponry that we have, the sword of the spirit. Anyway, um, I digress uh, now that we've uh, went through the entire book of Job in about 10 minutes. Okay, so where were we here? Uh, number nine. So uh, God had uh, Haman promoted at this exact time. And Mordecai is already positioned. He refuses to bow down and worship. Now, number 10, God sets Haman up. This is a setup. And now he's enraged. He convinces the king. And this irrevocable edict is now issued to annihilate all the Jews. Number 11, God had Mordecai in the perfect position at the perfect time in order to hear of Haman's evil plan. Esther hasn't heard it yet, but God had Mordechai there at the right time, and then he informs Esther of what has happened. Number 12, God had Esther positioned for such a time as this. That's why she was chosen to be the queen. That's why God gave uh, the king uh, eyes for her, so to speak, gave her favor in his eyes so that she stood out above all of the rest. And God positioned her for such a time as this as queen in order to approach the king knowing that if she perished, she perished. And she certainly could have. She has no guarantees that if she approaches the king uninvited, and he, she has no guarantee of the king holding out his scepter. Now, number 13, God controlled the outcome of the decree so as to have it be a battle against civilian forces instead of the Persian military. This is a detail that I found uh, going through it uh, another time. Uh, think about this. Uh, the, this was against the civilians there, the Persians in the, in the uh, empire, not the Persian military. That was God. Had it been the Persian military, then this would have been considerably more difficult. Number 14, pardon me. God also controlled the outcome of the lot, the poor, uh, that was cast. God, the, the proverb says, man casts the lot, but the Lord determines the outcome. So the Lord determined the outcome, and in so doing, he gave the Jews over nine months to prepare for the ensuing battle. Number 15, God gave Esther favor in the eyes of the king who put out his scepter when she did approach him uninvited under the possibility of death in order for her to plead her case for her people. I really believe, and I, you've probably, like me, seen the movies that depict it, and I, in all fairness, you can't expect movie producers, and certainly not Hollywood, to get it right. They, they almost, you know, they kind of drag it out before he puts the scepter out, and it's almost like he's, he's you know, looking around and, and doing it because, you know, all of his men are looking at him going, what are you going to do? She needs to be put to death. You cannot do this. And then he, almost, almost like he does it reluctantly, that's not what happened. It's, here's what I believe happened according to the text. When she walked in uninvited to approach the king, God had put it on his heart immediately. My queen, now keep in mind, he hadn't seen her in a month, is what Esther told Mordecai. When Mordecai is telling her, don't think that you're going to escape. We're all going to perish if you don't do this. You and your whole household is going to perish. So you have to do this. And if you don't do this, and of course, deliverance will come from another. But I'm of the belief that when she walked in, he immediately put that scepter out. 
my queen. He loved her. Why did he love her? Because God gave him a love for her, a love that only he can give. This was immediate. It was instantaneous. And it was God who did it. So she now has his ear. And when she does number 16, God gives her the wisdom to withhold her request and invite the king and Haman. Now keep in mind, it's not likely, though we're not told, it's not likely that Haman was present at the time that uh, she approached him. So if he wasn't present, and I don't believe that he was, this was God's wisdom. See, it's in those moments, uh, I think about what Jesus said to the disciples, said, do not fear in that moment or in that hour what you shall speak, for God will give you in that moment what it is that you're to say. And I really believe that in that moment, God gave her exactly what she was supposed to say and perhaps more importantly, what she was not supposed to say. And so Haman isn't there, so possibly. So she says uh, to the king, hey, I want to uh, have you and Haman uh, come to uh, this banquet. And then when they go to that banquet, uh, he then again asks her, what uh, is your petition? And he, she uh, says, I want you to come to a second banquet. Now think about this. Now Haman is there at the first banquet, obviously, right? And all full of himself, thinking he's all that. <laughs> In fact, he even bragged about it. Uh, the queen has invited only me and the king to the banquet. Wow. Well, anyway, so uh, when... She's asked again at, at this banquet, then the first banquet, then that's when God gives her the wisdom to not uh, say what it is that is uh, her petition. Uh, this is probably one of the more interesting and fascinating uh, things that God does uh, behind the scenes because a lot's going to happen that night. That The night between the first banquet and the second banquet. Oh my goodness. Um, uh, I, wanna, I wanna make sure I get this right. I wanna say it was in the span of, well, it had to be less than 24 hours, but I'm gonna say probably in a, in a span of about 12 to 18 hours, everything is going to happen and God is delaying uh, this uh, petition uh, because a lot of things are gonna happen now. That, that's going to be a very interesting night uh, in the kingdom. This is number 17. Now, that same night after the banquet, uh, Haman's all, you know, happy about the banquet. And then um, he's in a rage as he's on his way home from that first banquet. This is that night because Mordechai would not bow down and worship him. And we're told that he was so enraged that he wanted to kill him. But God, <laughs> but God restrained Haman, who could have killed him and certainly would have had God not restrained him. God did that. That's number 17. Number 18. This is now that same night now. This is a very busy night, okay? So God gives the king a case of divine insomnia for the life of him that same night. This is the night between the first and the second banquet because the second banquet that she invites the king and Haman to and the king grants it is the next day. So this is all happening that night. And so he can't sleep. So what does a king do when he can't sleep? He can't watch Netflix, can't watch Amazon Prime. So he can't, you know, stream anything. He's not going to go on his mobile device. So what's he going to do? Well, he's going to have the records, the chronicles, the annals of the kingdom, as boring as they are, read to him. 
That was God. And so he has his men uh, go and fetch these records. Now, that very same night, meanwhile, back at the ranch, as we say, with Haman, um, Haman probably didn't sleep that night either because he is so enraged and he's, you know, talking to his wife and keep in mind he has 10 sons, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. And he's so enraged and he then that very same night, I told you it was a busy night. It was so busy that he has gallows made in order, because he comes up with this idea his wife says, hey, this is what you should do. His men are saying, yeah, this is what you should do. So he has these gallows built. I don't know how long it took. Probably had a bunch of arties that were really good with wood. <laughs> a 75-foot uh, pole to impale somebody on. How long would that? Could you do that in a night? Okay, see, there you go. Wow. <laughs> well, anyway, we're going to pray for you then. But uh, so he has these gallows uh, built that same night. A lot is happening and God is in it and behind it all. Number 20. God now, meanwhile, back at the uh, sleepless night, uh, sleepless in Persia, Here's the king, can't sleep. The men are now in the library with all of these records, presumably hundreds, if not thousands. And God has these men select, well, let's not take that one. I like that one. Nah, let's take that one. Let's get, I mean, how random is that not? Because that's the hand of God moving behind the scenes, directing them to select the one that has the account of Mordechai saving the king's life. The exact record. That, that's God. Only God can do that. <coughs> I'm going to get too excited. <coughs> Start coughing again here, number 22. So then, um, <laughs> they come back. And God has them, I don't know how, and these are in scrolls, right, on parchments, okay. So picture this, they're opening this scroll as lengthy as it probably was. And wouldn't you know it, they read the exact place in that record because, and, and the reason I suggest this is because had they started at the beginning where the meeting was called to order, uh, you know, so-and-so made a motion, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> the king's gone. He's asleep by that point. So I really believe that God had them go right to the part where, oh, on this, on such and such a date, let it be recorded that one Mordechai the Jew exposed a plot to assassinate the king. Um, here's the king, he's trying to sleep. You think he's sleeping now? Wait a minute, I remember that. What, what did we ever do for that guy? Oh, um, <clears throat> let's see, let me read on here. Yeah, I don't see anything was uh, done, uh, king. Uh, your, your majesty, <laughs> I don't see there's nowhere in there where it says that we rewarded him. He saved my life. Are you kidding me? Nope, there's, there's nothing here. Okay, all right. Um, I don't think he slept that whole night because uh, it's now going to be early in the morning and <laughs> God arranges it so that uh, Mordecai now is uh, going to, he's very determined to make sure that uh, Mordechai is rewarded. The king is very determined. And uh, he demands that now uh, this man is rewarded. And at that moment, it, this, it's been said that God's timing is always perfect. He's never late. He's never early either. See, we don't want Haman coming in any earlier than the exact time that he comes in. Because that's going to mess everything up. Because the king hasn't learned yet that Mordecai hadn't yet been rewarded. So Haman can't 
come in yet. I think he got stuck at some traffic lights on the way because, uh, or his chariot broke down. You'll forgive my silliness. I'm just trying to give you some, you know, uh, perspective here. Uh, He delayed Haman, who probably didn't sleep either again. The gallows built and he's so excited. He's going to go into the king early because he wants to ask for the king's approval to have uh, Mordecai hung on that gallow. And this is number 23. God has uh, Haman arrive at the king's palace. I mean, and maybe I'm going out on a limb here, but I want to say within the exact minute, if not less than a minute. And his men say, oh, king, uh, Haman is here. And meanwhile, they're discussing and the king is asking, what shall we do to reward this Mordecai and honor the man whom the king delights to honor? And, and oh, Haman's here. Maybe he has an idea. <laughs> oh, he's got an idea. He has a couple of ideas as a matter of fact. And so God timed it perfectly, perfectly. Here's, here's her man. It's early in the morning. He hasn't even had his coffee yet. And the king says, bring Haman in. Can you imagine what Haman is thinking? Oh my goodness, this is perfect. I don't have to wait. The king can see me. I can get this dealt with. I can get Mordecai on that gallows and then I can go and join myself at the queen's banquet. <laughs> Boy, is he in for a surprise. And then number 24, uh, he's there to ask the king if it's okay if he hangs Mordechai. And before he can ask the king that, God times it perfectly. And the king asks Haman, hey, Haman, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. What, what a pleasant surprise. Um, what do you think I should do? What, what do you think should be done for the one whom the king delights to honor? Oh, 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 oh king, you're just, oh, stop, stop. This is, this is too good. This is too much. I couldn't have asked for, I mean, not only am I going to hang Mordecai, but I'm going to be honored by the king. Wow, it doesn't get any better than this. So he goes off on this elaborate idea of how you should honor this man. Put him on your horse. He's already pictured himself on the horse. (laughs) Robe him in your robe. And, and, oh, here's what you want to do. Um, you want to have somebody parade him through the street. You know the streets. The streets that he himself would parade himself through, demanding everybody bow down and honor him and worship him. This is a dream come true. Now, I want somebody to declare, as I'm riding on the king's horse, Wearing the king's robe, I want them to declare of me, (laughs) this is what is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honor. And oh my goodness, the the king is just, I mean, what a great idea. Oh man, I knew, I knew. I mean, that's, that's why we pay you the big bucks, right? So he says, you know what? That's a perfect plan. So here's what I want you to do. And don't leave anything out because that is, that is spectacular. Here's what I want you to do. Yeah, yeah. I want you to do everything you said. Don't leave anything out. And do it for Mordecai, the Jew. I, and I know when we were there in that chapter, I made the comment that I would have done just about anything to have been there. I wonder if, well, probably not. But in heaven, wouldn't it be amazing if we could have, in in heaven, if they have like, you know, video 
of how all of this really went down. I, that, that's the first video I'm going to live stream in heaven, is the video of what the look on. Is that weird? It's a little bit weird, isn't it? But oh well. But I just, I would love to have seen the look. Can you imagine? All the blood ran out of his body. He, he must have turned pale white. And keep in mind, uh, as a Persian, uh, he had skin pigment like mine. And he must have been white as a ghost, as they say. I, I wonder if, because uh, there's no record of any kind of response, you know, like, as you have said, let it be done. I, I bet he couldn't talk. I bet he, I guess now he's not going to ask the king if he should hang Mordecai. Could you imagine? Okay, okay, king. All right, I get it. Whatever. I'll do that. But then afterwards, can I hang him on the uh, gal? No, nah, that's not going to work. So he probably can't even talk. And he can't get out of there fast enough. And then actually the narrative seems to indicate that he runs home <laughs> in shame. And that's number 27. And this, this is all happening now that morning. And there's every indication that this is early in the morning, right? So th this is all the night before. Now keep in mind, uh, the banquet, what time is it? What, what time was that banquet? So he runs home. He's probably not even thinking about the banquet. He runs home and he tells his wife and he tells his man all that it had happened. And his wife, interesting, his wife would say this to him. And basically, this is what she says to him. Um, Honey, <laughs> um, you are in deep kimchi. She was local. And so if, if this Mordechai is a Jew that you have come up against, you will not prevail. Uh, this is uh, uh, another uh, loose paraphrase. But uh, honey, you have sealed your fate. Now, here's what happens. Uh, and this is number 28. This again is God's perfect timing. Watch this. They're still having this intense dialogue of sorts. And as they're still talking, men show up at the door. Haman, come on, man. <laughs> it's time to go. And again, there's like this urgency. I mean, his head's got to be spinning. I mean, when it wasn't, what, maybe an hour or at the most, maybe a couple hours prior, he was skipping to the, to the king. Can't wait to get to the king and get Mordecai on that, that gallows. I, I'm sure he looked at it as he left his place on his way to the palace and thought to himself, all right. Uh, looking at it like this, 75 feet tall, yeah. Visioning Mordecai impaled at, as cruel and unspeakable uh, as that uh, was. A, a cruel way to die. And it's, of course, reminiscent of and even a type of the crucifixion. Just horrible. And with great excitement, just a couple hours before, he had walked by the very gallows that now men are taking him with an urgency past on the way to the banquet. Could you imagine? Is there any way we can reschedule? I have had a really rough night and my day is not off to a very good start. You ever had those days where you uh, wake up and everything that could go wrong goes wrong and in a hurry and you wish you could just go back to bed and start all over again? Or you wish that you could just fast forward and it's the end of the day. You can just go to bed and wake up and start all over tomorrow morning. You don't have that? Is it just me? Well, anyway, I have those kind of days. Well, Haman is certainly having that kind of day. And so they whisk him off while they're still talking. And he's now on his way. to. The, he hasn't even showered uh, after all of this. Number 29. Now, they're at the second banquet, and God puts it on Esther's heart and gives her, and when you read the words, we have the account, 
And I am so thankful that God, by the Holy Spirit, preserved the record, and we have the record in our Bibles of what she said to the king. It is so eloquent. It is so beautiful. It is so perfect. It is so gracious. And she basically, when the king says, what is your uh, petition? Up to half of my kingdom. And she finally does it. And she says, please, O king, basically, will you please spare me and my people? And the king is absolutely incensed when he learns of this evil plan to annihilate the Jews. And then he discovers, see at this point, Haman and the king do not know that Esther, the queen, is a Jew. So they're just now finding out. Oh, because remember when uh, Haman got the king to issue the edict, he did not say it was the Jews that he wanted to annihilate. He said there are certain people. It was very cryptic. A certain people. Oh, do you think the king would have agreed to this had he known that the certain people were the Jewish people of which his queen was one? Well, that wasn't going to happen. So he has within a matter of seconds learned that not only has he been deceived by his right hand man, Haman, who deceived him, who tricked him and got him to issue this edict, but he's also learned that his queen, whom he loves, is a Jew, and the edict that he issued by his own hand under this deception means that now she, because of him, is going to be, <laughs> okay. I think this is where they come up with terms like post-traumatic stress disorder, because now here, Haman has just had, I mean, the shock of his life, and now, he finds that not only was Mordechai the one that the king wanted to honor, but the uh, queen is a Jew. And he has just gotten into the crosshairs of, I'm, I'm wondering when, and I, and I picture Esther pointing at, because when the king wants to know who did this, and she points to, <laughs> This is another time I would have liked to have seen the look on his face. I mean, he's sitting there, he's just getting ready to eat some lobster and maybe some, you know, um, prime rib. And he's got in, who, and it, oh, <laughs> that was me. That was me, that wicked Haman. That's who devised this evil plan. It was him. This is number 30. Now, I, I'm, I was thinking about this today. I, I don't, the only thing that explains why the king would do what he did and leave is that he was just so overcome with anger at what he's just been told, what has just been exposed. Okay. What's at stake here? Well, first of all, Haman's done. That, that's, that's a foregone conclusion. But now he's got his queen who months from now is going to be uh, killed because of this. And again, it was his hand that issued this, this edict. Now, that's the only thing I can think is, is that but God's the one that moved on his heart to have him leave. Because that's going to be key. Because now it's just Haman and Esther. And God has orchestrated that very, almost seemingly insignificant detail. This is a very important detail because of what's going to happen. This is number 31. Now the king is gone. Haman knows that he, he's a dead man. 
So what does he do? He pleads with Esther to spare his life. And it's not just that he pleads with her, it's how he pleads with her. He throws himself on her. He is begging her for his life. Now there's an irony here, and I think we, 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 we talked about it briefly, but think about this. Um, Esther did not plead with uh, Haman for her life. Now Haman is pleading with Esther for his life. No, she didn't plead with Haman. She pleaded with God. Remember when she fasted and prayed? Well, God hearkened unto the voice of her cry, and her life was spared, and she would be saved, as would all of her people. But isn't that ironic? And so here's this coward, and he is a coward. He is a coward. This is no man. This is no man. He is begging her for his life, and he throws himself on her at the exact time. I love this. I love it when God does things like this. So he's, he's on the queen, man. You can't, this is unthinkable. You're hitting on my wife? And at that moment, God puts it on the king's heart to go back in. He, he's probably going to go back in and say, you know what? Get him out. He's dead. Get him out. And he comes in <laughs> and he says, what? You would ass assault the queen too? It, you, but, so <laughs> he, <laughs> this is number 32. Oh, I love this book. He has his face covered and won't even look him in the eye and will not give Haman the the privilege of ever seeing his face again, and they escort him uh, out. But not before another very interesting detail takes place that God's hand is in and all over. Oh, the king's men are watching this whole thing go down. And they don't like Haman. And one of them uh, speaks up and says to the king, oh, by the way, king, uh, not so fast. You know, um, last night, you know, when you couldn't sleep and you, you know, wanted to have the records read to you and you learned that uh, Mordecai, uh, the Jew, saved your life. Well, while that was all happening, you know what Haman was doing? Well, he was building these gallows and he was going to come to you and ask you if it would be okay if he hung that same Mordecai on that gallows. What a coincidence. <laughs> hint, hint. And then the king says, oh, what a great idea. I like you. What's your name again? <laughs> so hang him on the gallows. Hang him on the... I wonder if at that point... Haman is remembering what his wife had told him just maybe an hour earlier. Again, everything's happening really fast right now, okay? I wonder if he remembers. Uh, honey, if you go against, if this Mordecai is a Jew, and obviously he is, duh, um, you won't prevail. You're, you're a dead man. And uh, certainly, uh, and then some. Not only is he a dead man, he's a dead man the way that he wanted Mordecai to be a dead man on the very gallows that he had just walked by and is now going back to, directly to. He's not going to stop anywhere and get breakfast. He's going directly to those gallows where he will be met with a, an unthinkable death. So, number 33, God then has Haman this is God did this. He has Haman impaled and hung on those very gallows. Number 34, God orchestrated the turn of events perfectly to where Mordecai would now be in a position of power. He now takes Haman's position. We also read that Esther and Mordecai basically took everything that had once 
earlier belonged to Haman. And God did that. God turned it around. And look how quickly things can turn. I, I, I say that because I know in my own experience, in my own life with the Lord, um, I can be in the midst of a very difficult situation, very perilous even, and very perplexing, uh, and very uh, hard. And God can, with a stroke of a pen, so to speak, just turn it around. He can turn it around in an hour. He can do it in a minute. I think about those Psalms, we've talked about them. Uh, Weeping lasts for the night, but joy returns in the morning. I love that. Because there's been some times where uh, you go to bed at night, you're certainly not sleeping, you're tossing and turning, and when you get up, you can't go back to sleep because this bomb has just went off in your life. This adversity has just struck in your life, and you keep, you're just thinking about, and, and, and there's the enemy right there, right? And you're entertaining these fears, these uh, worries, you know, what if, what if, what if, and you can't sleep, and the joy, His mercies are new every morning. And I've had, as God is my witness, I've had those mornings where I went to bed the night before thinking, man, this is not good. Only to have God as only He can and as He's always so faithful to do in the morning, just have it turn around like that. And sometimes it can just be one phone call. Just one phone call, one email, and it changes everything. That's God. That's God. He can turn whatever it is that you're in the midst of, He can turn it around like that. How quickly this had turned around. Mordecai, how, how many days earlier was he in sackcloth and ashes, mourning and, and weeping and fasting and praying? after this edict had been. What if you had gone to Mordecai and said, Mordecai, (laughs) just wait, you'll see. Why, God, are you allowing Haman to seemingly prevail against us? Why, Why did you allow him to get the king to issue this just wait, you'll see. Um, (laughs) You have no idea what I'm up to, but you'll see. Uh, It won't be long, Mordecai. Right now you sit here uh, in in sackcloth and ashes. Uh, It won't be long before you'll be the most powerful man in the kingdom. You won't be at 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 the gates of the kingdom. You're going to be seated on the throne. You're, you're going to have the very signet ring on your finger that uh, the king gave to Haman to seal that edict that he issued. That's going to be on your finger. You're going to have that power. You'll see. Just wait. I, I'm doing. I'm working on a few things. I'm. I'm. I got a few things. I, I gotta. You know. I'm. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Just uh, give me some time. Give me some time. You'll see what I'm going to do. But. When I do it, you're going to go, oh, wow. Oh, wow. And how true is this in our lives? We go through those really hard times. And here's God just, just say, just wait, just wait. You, just, you'll see, you'll see. You, it's, <laughs> doesn't Romans 8.28 still apply to us? By the way, we're going to be talking about this on uh, uh, Sunday in Ephesians chapter 1. So, Uh, Where were we here? So number 35, we're almost uh, done here. Appreciate your patience. So God equips the Jews with all that they needed in order to be victorious when that day of battle had come upon them. Again, uh, it's an irrevocable edict, but then so too is the new edict that the king has Mordecai uh, with that signet ring issue. And this... Uh, new edict gives the Jews all that they need to prevail in the battle. And that speaks applicably to our lives as well. God has given us the victory, just like he gave them the victory. There are going to be battles in our lives that we're going to have to fight, but God gives us the victory in those battles. We still have to go to battle. It's still going to be a spiritual battle, and it will always be a battle this side of heaven. Number 36, 
God gave them favor in the eyes of many Persians who were told became Jews because the fear of God had come upon them. Uh, they, had, they had come to the God of the Jews because of all that God had done for the Jews. <laughs> it won them to their God. Number 37, God put it on Esther's heart to request that the king hang Haman's 10 sons. Remember them? Remember their names? Those were gnarly names and they all had uh, horrible meanings to them too. Sinful names actually. But she had, this was God, she had the 10 sons also put the death on the gallows. And we talked about how that was just and how that was righteous and actually obedient to the command of God concerning the Amalekites. Number 38, then God arranged for the Jews to institute a feast to commemorate and celebrate all that God had done for his people, the Jews, which is celebrated to this day. In fact, it's coming up in Israel uh, here in a few weeks. Now, it's important to understand that all God did was done in the realm of the providential and not in the realm of the miracle. And I'll explain what I mean by that. God did not intervene by way of the miraculous. He certainly could have in an instant, but he chose not to. Rather, in his sovereignty, he moved in their affairs in every intricate detail of their circumstances providentially. Now, why is that important? Because, and this is where the personal application comes in, it speaks to how oftentimes God will choose to use his divine providence to move in our lives as he arranges the circumstances of our lives. And he does that because he knows best what's best for us. Certainly he could do it in the miraculous. But think about this. If God would have done this in the realm of the miracle, it would have kind of not been as exciting. It would have just kind of, we would have just, maybe the book of Esther would have only been three or four chapters. Haman did this and God said, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh, zap. And he did a miracle and they were victorious and they lived happily ever after. You don't have any, any of this that we looked at tonight. Charles Spurgeon said of this, it has been well said that the book of Esther is a record of wonders without a miracle and therefore though equally revealing the glory of the Lord, it sets it forth in another fashion from that which is displayed by miraculous power. Did you, did you catch that? whether it's God's providence or God working in the realm of the miraculous, he's glorified either way. Sometimes I would venture to say it's more glorious when it's in the realm of the providential, as we see with the book of Esther. Now, let me hasten to say, and this is important, please listen to this. And again, we're going to be talking about this uh, maybe a little bit more in depth on uh, Sunday in Ephesians chapter one, but God never forces his will on us. We're gonna be talking about uh, predestination <laughs> on uh, Sunday. I was telling, <laughs> telling my wife, I said, honey, pray for me. <laughs> We're gonna, we have to talk about, this is a really intense passage of scripture from verses three to verse 14 where Paul mentions twice about how we're predestined. And of course, this has given rise to the doctrine of uh, what's known as Calvinism, the five points of Calvinism, uh, which is a false teaching, by the way. We're going to be talking about that. But God does not force his will upon us. We have our own free will to choose. Never think for a second that God in his sovereignty providentially forces his will on us. God in his sovereignty as only he can without violating man's free will is able to providentially rule over all and overrule all. And he does all without violating our free will. We still have 
responsibility. Does God predestine those who are going to be saved? Yes. God knows the end from the beginning. Yeah, I'm getting, I'm not going to do Ephesians and Job tonight. I won't do that to you. So <laughs> you have to come on Sunday morning and we'll, we'll tackle that very touchy topic. Okay. Well, anyway. God overrules all, rules over all, and he overrules the wickedness and evil of man without violating free will, so as to have it ultimately serve his purpose in the end. Again, God lives outside of time. He sees the end from the beginning. He doesn't live within the confinements of time. Again, Charles Spurgeon said it best this way. There it is. Man is a free agent in what he does, responsible for his actions, and verily guilty when he does wrong. And he will be justly punished too. And if he be lost, the blame will rest with himself alone. But yet there is one who ruleth over all, who without complicity in their sin makes even the actions of wicked men to subserve his holy and righteous purposes. Boy, Haman is the poster child for that. God, Haman served, a wicked man by the name of Haman served God's holy and righteous purposes purposes perfectly. Believe these two truths, Spurgeon says, and you will see them in practical agreement in daily life, though you will not be able to devise a theory for harmonizing them on paper. You know what's really interesting about Spurgeon? I had, because there are those who believe that he was a hardcore Calvinist. I had somebody who is very well versed, a scholar really, uh, when it comes to uh, refuting Calvinism, tell me this. He said, uh, if Charles Spurgeon was alive today, uh, he would not qualify to be the Calvinist of today. Uh, he's, he's, Calvin, well, I'm doing it again. And don't look at your watches. We only got a couple minutes left, so I'm going to move on. Um, I, I wonder if even John Calvin would have been a five-point uh, Calvinist like what our uh, five-point Calvinists uh, today. If, anyway, let's talk about the typology. Actually, there's a couple of things I want to talk about real quickly, and then we'll uh, bring it to a close. Um, it's amazing. The typology is amazing. In a book that not one time mentions the name of God, now, uh, I did a, a considerable amount of research on this, and what I found was that while the name of God is not written in the book, we obviously see that the mighty hand of God is throughout the book, and actually, it is believed that the name of God does appear in several places by way of what's known as an acrostic. Listen to this. One noted that the name of God is hidden no less than eight times in acrostics in the book of Esther. Four times it appears as an acrostic, the famed tetragrammaton, which is the consonants YHWH. The Jews don't use vowels. It's irreverent. That's why uh, when you read a, a Jewish writing, it's G underscore D, no O. They don't, they don't use the vowels. So the tetragrammaton is just a big fancy word for Yahweh without vowels, Y-A-H-W-E-H, or it comes from Yehovah, Y-H-V-H, no E, no O, no A. Uh, it appears once as E-H-Y-H or I am as at the burning bush. And get this, it also appears, again, in acrostic form, uh, Mashiach in Hebrew, Messiah in Arabic, which is uh, Messiah in acrostic form in the book of Esther in the Hebrew. And Yeshua, which is Jesus. And El Shaddai. Remember our, our study in the uh, discussion about El Shaddai, God Almighty, which is where we get the Hebrew sheen.
today, the abbreviation for the name of God. They all appear in these many forms by way of an acrostic no less than eight times in the book of Esther. Isn't that amazing? Well, before we get into the typology, I, I really need to qualify this, and it's really important that you uh, listen to me on this, because uh, sometimes you can take typology a little bit too far, and I'm certainly uh, prone to do that and, and read too much into it. So I want to clarify what typology is and what typology is not. First, what typology is. Typology is a shadow person thing or event that symbolizes something that's yet future. Whenever we partake together of communion, we always talk about the typology in the Passover and how uh, they, they put the blood on the doorpost in the shape of a cross. It was a foreshadow of that which was to come. And Jesus fulfilled the Passover uh, prophecy that it was a type, a type. Uh, but listen now, please. Th this is what typology is not. Typology is not an allegorizing of something making it fictional. This was an actual event. The Passover was an actual event when the angel of death passed over. So when you start talking about typology, please, please, please don't minimize it or even allegorize it and lose the powerful meaning of this actual event. It is only a type that points to something yet future. And certainly in the book of Esther, we have uh, much in the way of typology. I'm going to do this uh, real uh, briefly. I appreciate your, your patience. with. I just don't want to end the book of Esther. Is that okay? <laughs> so can we just go till about, um, now we won't. Okay, here's one. Queen Vashti, now I know that there are those uh, that disagree with me on this, but I see Queen Vashti as the Gentile bride, not Esther. I see Esther as a type of Israel, because she's a Jew. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment. So Vashti is the Gentile bride that's removed before Haman, a type of the Antichrist, is revealed. And so Vashti becomes a picture, and she's a Gentile, not a Jew. So she's a picture of or a type of the church. Now, I've, I've heard a really good explanation as to why uh, some believe that Esther is a type of the bride of Christ, and I see how they get there, and that, I guess, is, um, you know, plausible. But I really do see uh, Esther as uh, a type of Israel because Esther replaces Vashti as queen to the king just as Israel is restored and reconciled to her king during the tribulation. The church is gone. Vashti removed prior. Haman, uh, an Amalekite, hated the Jews. Clearly, Haman is a type of the Antichrist who will have a demonic and satanic hatred for the Jews. Haman, of course, sought to annihilate the Jews just as the Antichrist during the seven-year tribulation will seek to annihilate the Jews. This is interesting. The fast, remember the fast that they had three days? Ended on the third day. It was on the 16th of Nisan. That was the exact day on the Jewish calendar that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the third day. That's a type. That's a shadow. Haman's evil plan does not succeed just as God will not allow the Antichrist to prevail. Mordecai. I see Mordecai as a type of the Holy Spirit. And here's how I get there. Mordecai was Esther's adopted father. By the way, this is going to be uh, in Ephesians uh, 1 on Sunday, Lord willing, too, because we're adopted. Not in the sense of a baby being adopted into a family, but uh, like a slave being adopted and becoming a joint heir. Well, uh, we're sealed. We're adopted, but we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And we have received the spirit of adoption and cry, Abba, Father, Romans 8, verses 15 and 16. Here's another reason why I believe Mordecai is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Mordecai was Esther's guide and counselor, just as the Holy Spirit is our guide and our counselor, our helper, 
paraclete in the Greek. Uh, this is interesting, back to Haman as a type of the Antichrist. Haman had 10 sons. Oh, interesting. The Antichrist will rule over 10 kings. Interesting. Mordecai refuses to bow down to Haman. The Jews will refuse to bow down and worship the Antichrist at the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation, three and a half years. Haman and his sons are destroyed in the end. So too will the Antichrist and his 10 kings be destroyed in the end. Uh, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. The king has a banquet that lasts seven days. Well, our wedding banquet will be at the end of the seven-year tribulation. If you really get into the, the typology, the feast lasts for seven days, the wedding feast of the Lamb. Now, lastly, the Feast of Purim is instituted. Some believe that Purim is a picture of the millennium. So that's the typology. Now, uh, we're almost done. Not really. No, we are. Uh, <laughs> but before we <laughs> bring it to an end, and I cry, um, I want to point out just some uh, final takeaways. And the first one is that we learn that God is able. <laughs> I know that's a cliche, and you'll forgive me, but God is able. God can do anything. If God can do this, are you kidding me? God can choreograph the steps of our circumstances and work them for His good and His glory in the end. We also learn, and we talked about this, that no evil plan will prevail. Greater is He that is in us than he that is in the world. Uh, this is a very important take away when it comes to pride. There's no exception here. And Haman is the perfect example here. Pride will always, only, always, without question, without exception, lead to a fall and ultimate destruction. And with Haman, we saw it very graphically, uh, another proverb that says, if you set a trap for a man, you'll fall into that trap. Boy, did that happen with Haman or what? The very gallows that he built for another, he himself was hung on those very gallows. And then lastly, um, God's mighty hand is at work behind the scenes even when we don't see it. Even when we don't, it, let, let me say it this way, especially when we don't see it. He is involved, He is involved in every aspect of our lives, whether they are big or small. And sometimes, more so in the very small details that we think are inconsequential to Almighty God. Like a parking spot. You know, we, we think God's got bigger things to worry about than answering my prayer for a parking spot at Costco Evile. So I don't have to park in like Waimanalo and shuttle to, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, especially uh, before a holiday. Have you ever tried to find a parking spot at Costco Evie Lay before Thanksgiving or Christmas? Forget about it. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. And so here uh, we pray about, oh, God, can you just get me a, um, you know, a parking spot? And then sure enough, Someone walks up and they look at you and he want my, I'm leaving. Yes, oh God, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And he's, he's involved in every little detail of your life. You know, sometimes, ah, sometimes, this, this, this is it. I, I, I'll end. In fact, I'm even going to put the last slide up there. There you go. By faith, we're going to end this study. So, I have, um, maybe this will be an encouragement uh, to somebody tonight. Um, when we were building this building, there were many little minute details that had come up. And we, we, we of course, had our share of the big issues that we had to uh, deal with. And, of course, those were the ones that you're on your face before God going, Oh, God, <laughs> please, oh, God, you know, you're fasting, you're praying sackcloth and ashes, oh, God. But there were some little details that um, I just brought before the Lord. I said, Lord, I know it's a, it's a little thing, but would you, um, you know, kind of work this out? And he always did. He always does. 
Never imagine for a moment that you're bothering God or you're, you're being a pest about something that is seemingly so inconsequential. Lord, it just, you know, I know it's a little thing, but I know that you're intricately involved in the little things too. Um, uh, how, do, how does that uh, saying go? Um, I'm, I'm totally going to botch it already, I can tell, but something to the effect of, um, you know, God, God is a big God, but he's not too big that he won't answer small prayers. He, he's a big God, but that doesn't mean he's not going to answer the, the small prayers too. God is in the big and God is in the small, and he's intricately involved in every detail of our lives. You have been so patient. I think I've gone an hour and a half on three verses in Esther chapter 10. Why don't you stand and we'll pray and we'll make it an hour and 32 minutes. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you so much. Ah, what an amazing book, God. What an am Thank you so much for including it in the canon of Scripture. Here we are all these generations later being so blessed by our study of it, all the lessons that we can take with us from it. Lord, thank you. I just pray that you'll not allow us to ever put this book on the shelf and let it collect dust in our lives. Certainly not the application that's within its pages. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.